welcome everybody to this PCR Valves e-course. It's a symposium sponsored by Abbott and we're going to talk about today about expanding our treatment options for patients with mitral regurgitation with the Tendine transcatheter mitral valve implantation system. It's my great pleasure today to have uh, two of the world renowned and most sophisticated experts in the field. One is Stefan from Badeleb from Mainz. Hello Stefan. And the other one is Paul Suraja from Minneapolis. Hello Paul. And the three of us will lead you to this program today that we will see on the next slide. So this is our program for today. I'm going to give a short introduction on where we are now with the Tendine TMBI system. And then Stefan is going to talk about how to integrate the Tendine TMBI into your transcatheter mitral valve program. And Paul is going to speak about left ventricular remodeling and hemodynamic improvement for patients treated with this system. And then we'll have some closing remarks. And of course, there will also be time for discussion. So I think we should go right into the meat and I will start with my first presentation on the status of Tendine right now. My name is Hendrik Trede, I'm cardiac surgeon from Bonn. So the whole Tendine story started out in 2014 with the first acute implantation and it took only until 2017 with uh, the first 100 patients treated. The valve is the only TMBI system on the market that's CE marked. This happened in 2019. And since the beginning, we have now implanted more than 400 patients. We collected data in the global feasibility study and the expanded clinical study with more than 350 patients so far. And uh, just recently, the RESOLVE trial started what is a post-approval study of the TMBI system, 109. And there's also the SUMMIT trial that is currently enrolling already and aims for 800 patients and up to 80 clinical sites. This is an overview of the summit trial. It's, an, of course, a trial that includes the heart team decision, uh, plays a big role here. And then patients are being randomized one-to-one -one, uh, between Tendine and the MitroClip, of course, only for patients who also meet the MitroClip indication. There will a, be a single arm in the cohort of MEC patients, so patients with major annular calcifications. And there's another thing, single arm that uh, then looks at the patients who are not suitable for the MitroClip, but will still get the Tendine system. So here we will look at the Tendine mitral valve system. It's a dual frame tri-leaflet bioprosthetic valve design. The outer frame of that valve is contoured to the mitral annulus and really nicely accommodates to the annulus. It comes in multiple valve sizes and profiles to address a broad range of patient anatomies. It's repositionally throughout the whole implantation procedure. The tether design is a unique uh, design about this kind of valve. It isolates the ceiling from securement and enables full retroability throughout the duration of the procedure. The apical path is then placed over the ventricular exercise and helps a lot to provide hemostasis afterwards. The valve comes in standard profile and low profile to also uh, accommodate patients who have the risk for left ventricular alpha tract obstruction. This is the delivery system. It uh, gives the operator full control over the delivery, uh, allows, as I already said, for repositioning and retrievability. It is very important with the tendine implantations that you have comprehensive screening and procedural planning going on. That includes echo and CT measurements. You look for the anatomical uh, features of the patient and uh, look if the valve is really fitting into the anatomy. There's also a virtual fit assessment that then excludes patients at risk for LVOT obstruction. And there's procedural guidance uh, given by simulated fluor imaging that's also very helpful throughout the procedure. Um, if we have a look at the clinical data, we can uh, now uh, look at the first 100 patients that have been implanted within the expanded clinical study. You see it's a typical TMBI patient population at the mid-age with septic. Five years, they were at high risk for surgery with an STS PROM of nearly 8%, and they, of course, have all been pretty sick patients. They were followed up, and, and follow up is complete in this trial for two years. And this is the data, and it was really astonishing to see that despite the very early experience with this uh, implantation, we had an implant success rate of 97%, and there was basically zero procedural mortality, zero stroke, zero emergency surgery and no patients needed ECMO. Uh, it's also astounding to see that only one of those 100 patients uh, had a major apical access complications. That's for a transapical procedure quite astounding. The mortality, of course, uh, was higher uh, over the follow-up period, but this is nicely in line with other trials in this patient population as the co-op trial 
and is more related to the comorbidities of the patients. Uh, the implantations have been highly effective when it came to elimination of MR throughout the two years. And it's really interesting to see that uh, close to 100% of all patients uh, at two years had basically zero MR and only very few had uh, grade one MR. Um, and there was also, of course, only two years follow up so far, but there was also no sign for structural valve degeneration. And patients profited also a lot in terms of clinical symptoms. Uh, if you have a look at the Neocard Association class throughout the first two years, it's uh, really good to see that at two years, 82% of patients were in Neocard Association class one or two only. Patients took also profit when it came to a hospitalization for heart failure. So the rate of heart failure hospitalizations per patient year was reduced by 47% with the implant of this valve. And overall, we can now try to answer the question, who's the perfect candidate for Tendine? And the beauty here is that you can use this kind of valve for primary and secondary MR patients who are at elevated risk for surgery, according, of course, to the multidisciplinary heart team. It's for patients who meet the anatomical criteria for Tendine implantation with regards to excess, LVOT, valve size. This all must be done very thoroughly. And, um, it's also great, especially from a surgical perspective, I have to say that this is also a device that works well in patients with major annular calcifications. Uh, of course, they have to have predominant MR, but um, in those patients, really surgery is not the best option uh, always. So I think this is a great startup for our symposium today. And I would now hand over to Stefan to give us an uh, overview on how to implement this valve into your transcatheter mitral valve portfolio. Dear Hendrik, dear Paul, thank you very much for the kind introduction. My name is Ross Stefan von Bartelim. I'm the head of the Heart Valve Center at the University Medical Center of Mainz, uh, Germany. If we look into the mitral interventions, we all know that we're dealing with a very complex valve. So mitral TMVI is more complex than a TAVI implantation. We deal with two different types of mitral disease, one of which is primary disease as already outlined by Henrik uh, with a prolapse flail situation and typically slightly smaller ventricles. And we have secondary MR being of mostly ventricular but sometimes also atrial uh, cause with a dilatation of the chambers, analyst dilatation leading to a severe co-optation deficit and regurgitation. If we look into mitral regurgitation, there is more and more data as here presented by Paul Suraja uh, on the baseline mitral valve um, situation, but also at the post-procedural MR and survival. And you can nicely see that even over a short follow-up period of 12 months, it is very beneficial to achieve a grade zero or one in the patients as already demonstration by, demonstrated by the introduction of Henrik. And this cuts the mortality into half. So if we look into mitral valve repair or replacement programs in high volume centers, there are many considerations for therapy options. One is valve anatomy, which may be primary or secondary. We look into the leaflet disease, the secondary causes as already outlined, LA size, annulus size, and LV size. The timing of the intervention is crucial. Uh, we may have urgent situations, but mostly we deal with chronic mitral uh, regurgitation. We look at MR severity at rest and during exercise at the symptoms of the patients. The patients usually in the secondary part of the disease are under guideline directed medical therapy which has to be initiated and controlled and stabilized over one to three months. We look at the evolution of the chamber sizes and at the ejection fraction. And we have interventional options and of course they have to be evaluated by their risk benefit ratio and we know, of course, that we have surgical valve repair, surgical valve replacement as options, but with higher risk uh, cohorts, we look more and more into transcatheter repair options as well as now with the first CE mark device into TMVI options for the patients. One of the uh, key studies and trials in this situation has been uh, the proof by the co-op trial that we may have an outcome benefit for the patients. And you can see nicely that the number needed to treat was low with about seven at 24 months and eight uh, at 37 months actually 
uh, to save one patient's life. And this has never been demonstrated before. So it's a very interesting rationale to look and to treat secondary MR. When we look into the CR marked clinical devices, actually in a commercial use at the moment, we see that we have a huge experience with the MitraClip, of course, as a leaflet therapy, exceeding 100,000 patient implantations. We have direct and indirect analplasty being below 2,000. We have the Pascal system at about 1,400 human implants. And now the first valve option with the tendon valve exceeding 400 implantations in humans. There are also new guidelines and new pathway descriptions as published here in JAK in May 2020 uh, by the American College of Cardiology and Robert Bono. And you nicely see that for the first time ever, we have the situation that we may see combinations of therapy uh, being interventional with PCI and TMVR as well as cabbage and mitral valve replacement on one side if you need revascularization. On the other hand, we have patients that have pure heart failure on dilative cardiomyopathy needing CRT, guideline-directed medical therapy, but then uh, we need an echo evaluation for the suitability and perhaps also a CT evaluation for these patients. And we have to look whether these patients are appropriate TMVR or TMVI patients, or whether they are surgical candidates. And as you can see, uh, the transcatheter programs here, given in bright yellow, which is a 2A recommendations, are upgraded from previous uh, guideline or position papers. There are complex morphologies where leaflet therapy has a limit. And I presented to you here some cases, and I hope the technical support can uh, start all four videos. We, you see that we may have technical heavy tethering where we are unable with a heavily tethered P2 segment here to do uh, actually normal edge to edge therapy. There may be huge indentations or clefts that can also uh, bring uh, leaflet edge to edge therapy to a certain limit and may cause a moderate MR at the end. We have the situation of fibrosis, sclerosis, and MAC, mitral annular calcification, which may be prohibitive and cause a lot of leaflet stress when you pull out those leaflets, causing a tear. So also here, a replacement may be beneficial. And of course, if we have, as the most complex situation, severe leaflet destruction. So here you see a, a cartoon of the uh, first commercially available TMVI valve, which has an apical access, as you see. It is a D-shaped system with a longer skirt along the aortic mitral uh, continuity. And you can see that we have the system on a tether, allowing for a retrievable situation until the very end of the procedure. The system can be clocked and turned and put into an anatomically suited position. The tether also provides a perfect double ceiling. And as you can see, and already described by Henrik in his introductory remarks, we have a unique situation with an apical pad that not only pulls with about 900 to 1000 grams on the mitral valve, keeping it into a position. So allowing not to use radial force alone, but also sealing the apical access and causing very, very low bleeding rates, which is also a very important feature. You can see that the experience is mainly in the US with 53%, Europe, following suit with about 42% and Australia with 5%. And there are more than 400 patients in total in clinical studies, compassionate use experience, and now also commercial real world experience. So what are the main challenges for all TMVI devices? And those main issues are possible LVOT obstruction. We know if the device is very large, especially in the ventricle, uh, we have to look in CT for the neo-LVOT, especially in systole. This is a 30%, 40% analysis in the cardiac cycle. We have to look and seal for paravalvular leakages because we know that they are outcome relevant. And this is a major spot on the design of the individual valve and also the relation of the valve design versus um, annular dimensions. Of course, there are two strategies for the access. One that is currently available is transapical access with a pad 
versus transept options. There have to be many available TMVI sizes. So, so this is also a key note in evaluating a TMVI device. And we have to look, because we have a lot of material, always be cautious for device thrombosis, which has been rare, but there are also anticoagulation schemes that are necessary for those valves. Here we can see the number of different profiles and also already highlighted, we have two profiles. One is a standard profile, giving us a larger valve with an EOA of 3.0 centimeter square, which is in favor for transcatheter programs because this effective valve size exceeds normal surgical um, implants. And we have a low profile, especially for the MAC patients, which Paul Zaraja will also allude to. And we can see that we can offer even smaller anatomies, something that accepts MAC and smaller Neo-LVOT system anatomies in those patients. Here's a short analysis of how we look into um, the uh, different, different possibilities. And you note that the excess is not the true apex of the ventricle. I'll keep this short as Paul will allude to this importance uh, also for the remodeling of the ventricle later in his talk. So we've already seen the first 100 patients treated and I will also go very shortly across this, but it's nice to see that both at 12 months and at 24 months, actually the rate of MR1 plus, so trace or zero is extremely high in this patient population, which had been a compassion use population. Also already addressed in the introductory remarks is that we have low procedural mortality, an extremely low ECMO rate of 0%, 0% procedural strokes, which is excellent. And we have a very, very uh, high comorbidity range population in those early 100 patients. What is also important to note, of course, is if I go back one slide, that for the first actually now 40 German implant patients, we have seen a 30-day mortality of only 0% compared to the 6%, which had been already been good for a very early situation with the device. This shows that after commercial use, this number can even be lower than before. Here you see an example of a case report from our Hot Valve Center, a typical patient, elevated risk. You see almost 80 years of age. He is a New York Heart Association class four, so he has symptoms at rest, secondary MR with severe tethering. And please look at the four images on the left-hand side at the lower right corner. And you can appreciate that these uh, regurgitations have been massive with an ROA exceeding 0.5 centimeters square. And the co-optation gap has also been huge. This is the wire going with the apical axis directly through the mitral valve. You can steer the system nicely. And as you see on the right-hand side, uh, you see the deployment and the rotate clocking rotation that is possible with this device uh, to the aorta. And you see a true view, photorealistic view on the right-hand side directly in the procedure. This procedure is mainly 3D uh, echo driven, you, so you need uh, very rarely uh, fluoroscopy just for a pigtail and for your pressure measurements during the uh, procedure. And here you see the result, a perfect trace or non-regurgitation, no paravalvular regurgitation. And please note that we have no gradients in those patients. So this being a standard profile, we only have one or two millimeters of mercury. And if you look at the fluoroscopy LV angio, you can nicely appreciate, this is of course not necessary to do it, but you can nicely appreciate that there is no regurgitation at all after injection with the ventricular pigtail. So integrating Tendine into your portfolio of actually high volume mitral repair and replacement also opens up new possibilities, especially with integrating Tendine into Mac experience which has been initiated by Paul Saraja. And you can nicely see that it's possible with certain limits of size, which may go down to about 2.8 centimeters, that we're able to implant instead of a Tavar procedure and Tavar device, a uniquely designed valve for the mitral situation. So leaflet therapy in these patients is absolutely no option. Conventional surgery is highly complex. If you decalcify those patients, there is a significant mortality and impact 
on the ventricle, especially in the posterior area. And leaflet anchoring of different TMVR devices may be very difficult. So the tendine concept relying on an apical tether may be so far be very promising. And we have seen more and more efforts as in this publication by Guerrero, putting up a cardiac computer tomography based score to categorize mitral annular calcification, which has not been available so far and to predict valve embolization. So valve embolization is not an issue with the tendon valve. This comes back to the use of tower prothesis in the uh, calcium itself. You can also see that we now have a distinction between mild, moderate, and severe. So a score below or at seven may be considered moderate or moderate to severe, and may be an indication in Europe for the tendine valve. You can nicely see this in this example from our center. Again, another 79-year-old patient, this time in New York Heart Association class three, but had been declined because of severe mitral annular calcification. He already had cabbage, so he was pre-operated. He already had a surgical aortic valve replacement and a Guerrero score of six, so definitely being moderate. And at the lower part, you can see the analysis of the same patient the calcium here is by computational virtual intelligence a little bit non-depicted to enable you to see the metal of the tendine valve, but it's the same patient. And we used the low profile 29 millimeter size of the tendine. We had experienced no PVL and even using the smaller valve, we only had a mean gradient of four, which is very acceptable in the small anatomy. So other issues that can be solved is the issue if we have exceedingly long anterior mitral leaflets or a small neo-LVOT. There are techniques that also have been published and you see the situation here that there may be a very good contraction, a very small ventricle, which may be present in primary mitral valve disease. And what you can do there is either by a snaring of a wire, this can be a normal coronary wire, where you put uh, either pressure or some radio frequency energy on, you can slit the interior mitral leaflet, preserving the chordae. And doing this uh, enables you to lower any gradients in the LVOT by pure transcatheter methods, in addition to a tendon implantation. A rare indication, but very useful. And here I show you something that leads over to the, um, to the presentation of Paul Saraja which is the right heart influence. This is a patient with his um, right heart tricuspic regurgitation being severe before implanting the tendon valve. You can note that we have a severe tethering of the leaflets being 1.5 centimeters in the ventricle. So not something for uh, very beneficial for repair. And we chose a replacement in this situation, a tendon valve. And the situation about 20 to 30 minutes later is given on the right-hand side. The tendon is in place and directly at the end of the procedure, you can see that within 20 minutes, 30 minutes, the regurgitation disappears and a severe TR is replaced by a trace TR simply by treating a mitral regurgitation with a tendon valve, giving a totally different hemodynamic situation and benefits to the patient. So these are my last remarks and I may sum up that percutaneous repair, of course, maintains to be the gold standard so far for a majority of patients. But if repair is not possible or a good result of MR1 plus is improbable, which is true for about 10% of all mitral, uh, transcatheter mitral valve repair attempts, TMVI is becoming a therapy of choice to achieve MR0 or trace in 98% of the patients. TMVI with tendine is the EMOC and currently the first choice because it is the first and the proven uh, valve, transcatheter valve replacement option that we currently have. And including compassionate use, it accounts worldwide for more than 60% of all TMVI attempts. So these were my last slides. I, I hand over to back to Henrik Trader and to Paul Suraja. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you, Stefan. This was really a brilliant overview on how to implement the tendine valve into a transcatheter valve portfolio. 
uh, of all the implanters out there. We decided and agreed to have no discussion after this talk, but to have a common discussion after Paul's talk. So Paul, can you please give yours? Well, uh, thank you all very much for this kind invitation and uh, certainly uh, miss seeing you uh, live in London this year, but hopefully we will get together again uh, very, very soon. So I've been asked to share with you uh, some of the most recent data on uh, ventricular remodeling that can happen after transcatheter mitral valve replacement. And I think, you know, we're all really excited to have this valve rolled out commercially in Europe and in the United States, we're working very hard to improve the enrollment in the study so that we can have uh, this technology more available here as well too. And I'm gonna start uh, by showing you a case. Uh, this is a 79 year old man who came to see us with ischemic cardiomyopathy, ejection fraction 35%. He had previous bypass and peripheral artery disease, including a renal artery stenting. This is his echocardiogram, and I know many of you have seen uh, these echocardiograms before. Uh, very typical secondary MR, a lot of regurgitation, lots of good leaflet morphology that could be repaired with transcatheter uh, therapy with mitral clip as well. Uh, but like uh, what uh, Dr. Von, von Redelayman was describing earlier, we had a long discussion about uh, residual MR versus a tendine with complete relief, and he elected to undergo uh, placement of a tendine uh, TMBI prosthesis. And very similar to what you saw before, uh, here uh, the tendine was placed, and he had complete uh, relief of the mitral valve regurgitation. A very, very satisfying uh, result and he left the hospital soon after that. And I wanna share with you where he is at now. Uh, this is him uh, five years later, and you can see the prosthesis is working beautifully. Uh, the positioning is exactly the same. There's also no uh, residual recurrent MR, and the patient is doing quite well. And just to give you an idea of how well he's doing, uh, he's offered uh, uh, us uh, his permission uh, to, to describe uh, uh, his symptoms. Uh, this is a picture of him. Okay, I feel great. I f don't feel any different now than I did when I was 25, other than the fact that I'm old and if I get up and do things in a hurry or whatever, I get tired. But I feel absolutely fantastic. So what we've learned is that this prosthesis can be used in a broad range of pathologies, and you've already seen some of these videos before, but patients with severe mitral annual calcification, even patients with previous surgical rings placed, and even patients with previous transcatheter repair with mitral clip. Uh, the relief of MR has been very consistent across a broad range of mitral disease, and it's very exciting to have this technology uh, to use to treat these patients. Now you've seen uh, these data already multiple times, uh, and the relief of MR is really quite complete. Uh, these are data from the one year, but we know these data now extend out to two years, and there's complete relief of MR was essentially all patients having no residual regurgitation. And the outcomes are actually quite favorable in terms of the symptom improvement with nearly 90% uh, or more patients having relief of symptoms being class two or, or class one and follow. Now you might ask, well, why do these patients get asymptomatic? And in terms of where is the clinical benefit uh, for placing uh, these prosthesis for relieving the MR? And this is an example, it's not just about relief of the mitral valve regurgitation. There's also potentially beneficial LV remodeling that can occur from both relief of the regurgitation with the prosthesis, as well as a unique apical pad and tether placement. This is one of our patients, and this is a 30-day follow-up. On the left-hand side is a pre-procedural CT, and on the right-hand side is a post-procedural CT, owing to the effects it's seen at just 30 days of follow-up with placement of the device as well as the apical pad. And I think you all can see how the LV has already come down in size in this patient who had secondary mitral valve regurgitation. So we recently looked at this in a larger cohort and these data were presented at uh, TCT just a month or two ago. And what we looked at is what were the changes in LV remodeling and what kind of hemodynamics improvement could we see with the tendine prosthesis? These were 191 patients who had been treated with Tendine as part of the early feasibility study, average age 74 years, eject fraction on average was about 45%. And what we did is we measured the chamber size in terms of the uh, chamber length, as well as normalizing it to the baseline LV size. 
And we also looked at other parameters such as spiricity index. And this is what we saw. Now, very consistent with the overall tendine uh, data, we saw improvements in MR with essentially complete relief of MR in all patients. There were changes in the KCCQ quality of life score. On average, the number of points increased was double digits, around 10 points. And you can see here that in, even at just one month, over 80% of patients had relief of symptoms with essentially class one or class two symptoms. Now, what was interesting is that when we looked at the chamber remodeling, there were changes in LV size already uh, seen at just one month. When you look at LV in diastolic volume index and systolic volume index, both of them decreased acutely. There were minimal changes in ejection fraction, but there were already improvements in forward stroke volume as well as cardiac output in these patients. Now, what we found was really interesting was that the changes in LV size or related to the baseline size of the heart. So it makes somewhat intuitive sense. The larger the LV at baseline, the more the change of LV size with placement of the tendon prosthesis. And please keep in mind that these changes are indexed. Here we have LV and diastolic volume and end systolic volume. These are indexed parameters. And these changes were evident at just 30 days of follow up with the CT analysis. And you can see a lot of the change was uh, diastolic, but we also saw changes in, in systolic volume with minimal changes in EF and significant improvements in forward stroke volume. Again, these were all very early changes with the prosthesis. Now our center also recently led an analysis that looked at the influence of the apical pad. And as many of you know, this is a very unique aspect of the prosthesis. And this paper was published on 36 patients uh, by our scholar Miho Fukui from Japan. And what she did is again, looked at the analyses both at baseline and at 30 day follow up. And what was interesting is that what we did is we looked at the location of the pad, whether it's anterior, anterior lateral or inferior lateral. And we looked at whether the pad was placed mid apical or distal apical. And on this chart here, you could see if you focus on the top middle segment, most of the pad placement was anterior lateral and in the distal apical segment. On average, about two and a half centimeters from the true apex. And in this analysis, 30 of the 36 patients had acute reduction in LV volume. And this is associated with placement of the pad closer to the true apex. Those who had reduction in volumes had shorter distance to the true apex. And when the apex, uh, when the pad was placed at the distal apex, there were acute reductions in LV volume. You can see the data here, uh, about 55 cc's drop. There were also reductions in LV mass acutely and also reductions in LA volume. So all of these chamber remodeling effects were beneficial and they all happened within just 30 days uh, of the procedure. So in summary, uh, we're very excited to show you some of these data because they really are the first glimpse of reverse remodeling with a TMVR prosthesis. And what we've seen is that the LV volume decreases in most patients in this early analysis with tendine. The beneficial changes are related to where the apical pad is placed relative to the true apex, as well as the baseline size of the left ventricle. And we suspect and believe that complete relief of MR and beneficial remodeling likely account for the improved clinical outcomes that we've been seeing in these patients. Thank you very much. Well, thanks, Paul. That's really interesting data, actually. And this may be very unique for the specific valve because it has this tether. And it's really interesting to see if this plays a role in uh, reverse remodeling of the ventricles. So, so for the discussion, I would start with Stefan, if I may. Uh, Stefan, we now have basically two transcatheter treatment options. We have transcatheter mitral valve repair and we have transcatheter mitral valve replacement. And I think I would be interested if you compare the two in terms of imaging needed, in terms of um, the procedure times and everything, can you somehow try to uh, place uh, the tendine implantation within the whole scenario of transcatheter mitral valve treatment? I think a very important aspect uh, in this discussion is, of course, the volume of the center. So um, currently we have, of course, a huge experience with transcatheter mitral valve repair. There's an increasing um, evidence and also experience in the centers with TMVI. 
I think the procedural times of both devices are very, very favorable. We don't need contrast in both devices during the procedure. Uh, we have procedural times that range between half an hour and slightly above an hour. So I think this is very beautiful for these patients because we also know that one of the outcome uh, predictors is procedural time in the OR and also stability of hemodynamics. And this is something we have not addressed yet. TMVI implant does not require rapid pacing. And in experienced centers, we actually preload even ventricles that have a reduced ejection fraction down to 30%, 28-30%. We preload them during the procedure with volume. And we changed our anesthesiologists to not give any inotropes during the procedure. And actually the patients tolerate this very, very well. And you don't have any, don't run into any troubles. So I would say giving no contrast at all during the procedure, of course, CT uh, imaging and CT preparation and TMVI is needed, um, is stabilizing the patients a lot. And I think the procedural times being around or less than one hour are also extremely favorable for both strategies. Paul, would you agree? I, I completely agree. Uh, when we did our first case, uh, the procedure time was exactly as you said. Uh, it was 60 minutes. And my surgeon turned to me and said, you know, if I'm going to put a tissue prosthesis in, I can't imagine why I would want to do it surgically because my cross step time is usually 60 minutes. So if my, <laughs> if my tendine procedure time is shorter than my surgical cross clamp for mitral valve replacement, I mean, it's really kind of a hard argument, uh, unless you have other concerns about the ability to do the valve uh, placement in, in these patients. And Henrik, if I may add that you may perhaps uh, continue as you're the heart surgeon here in our discussion. Um, I also have to say that blood loss is extremely low. So we continued with the last six patients in having a blood loss of less than 150 cc in total. So we use the cell saver we collect the blood, but there is almost no blood loss. And all our patients have not been given any blood unit uh, during the procedures. So I think this is also a very important aspect. And the pet may add to this. Perhaps you, you're the expert for the excess and the implants. So perhaps you can, you can share your experience here. Yeah, I totally agree. There's definitely no need for a cell saver here because it wouldn't make sense to have it. You would not retransfuse this small amount of blood anyway. And, uh, you know, this is a concern of especially many interventional cardiologists. They hear it's a transapical procedure, so then they remember the old times of transapical tarvi and think, oh, wow, this might be a difficult and, and you know, also maybe dangerous or unsafe procedure. But in fact, it isn't, as we've seen from the data and we've seen from the commercial experience now also. Uh, you were highlighting that of all the German implants, there was no death at all throughout 30 days and no bleeding complications at all. And this may have something to do with the PET um, because somehow the PET nicely seals the excess. And you hardly ever see when tying down the suture, you hardly ever see any bleeding coming from that excess point. And this is uh, clearly a big difference to transapical tabi, despite the fact that we have ventricles that are much more prone to bleeding because they are much, uh, have much thinner walls uh, compared to the you know, typical stenosis uh, um, um, ventricles. So that really is, is a dramatic difference. Um, Paul, may I come back to you? I mean, you gave really a very interesting uh, talk about the reverse remodeling of the tendine implantation. And of course, you may ask yourself, is now this an effect of the reduction of MR, or is that maybe indeed a defect of the tether? And can you differentiate between the two? Yeah, it's really hard. I honestly, I, I don't know the answer to that. You know, we have experiences with uh, other TMVR platforms and, and such. And, um, you know, obviously you all know uh, that Tendine is my favorite way to go. Uh, and it's because, as you were saying a moment ago, the procedure outcomes have been so safe. Uh, they have really, uh, if, you, if you think where we were a few years ago, when people were discussing transapical, just like you say, you know, an MR ventricle instead of an AS ventricle, it's going to be more dangerous, there's more bleeding, but that has not been proven the case, you know, and as a world has tried to transition towards transeptal, I've always advocated, well, you still have to match the tendine results because 0% procedural mortality is pretty hard to beat, even with a transeptal device. 
But you know, in terms of the remodeling, uh, I, I think that it has to do with both uh, the MR reduction as well as the pad, because we know that wall tension and wall stress is directly related to wall uh, to chamber enlargement. And we acutely reduce uh, the chamber size with the pad. And I think that helps with the relief of MR, which people initially were concerned that, oh, maybe we're uh, changing the afflo too much in these patients. But what we've seen, and I know in your experiences from time and time again, even if the EFs are very low, the deployment of valve is very safe. Uh, and there's virtually no hemodynamic instability and the patients tolerate it really well. And I think that pad and the placement helps with the annular descent uh, at, at, during the contraction of these patients that helps uh, also with the relief of MR, which we initially feared, but uh, do not fear now. Yeah, and I think we could add that uh, okay, this is like a subvalvular, actually a subvalvular um, uh, um, introduction like uh, a suture and string method in, in cardiac surgery. And we, we know that uh, from the old, old valves with uh, cages, that those ventricles deteriorated because the cords were cut uh, in past times, 30 years ago. And I think this is something to learn. And we, we opt for an additional cordal support that is much stronger, that supports a kilogram of load and reduces the wall stress of these diseased ventricles. So I think it's something really to look into uh, in far more detail. Yeah, it's a, it's a giant cord that we're placing. <laughs> so I wonder how much of that has a beneficial effect. It's a great question. Okay, uh, thank you very much to both of you. Um, we are at the end of our symposium. I'm very sorry. I have one last slide uh, that somehow sums up with everything you said today. So maybe we can bring this up. Finally, to summarize what we've been discussing during this very interesting symposium, uh, I think, especially from a surgical perspective, it's, it's really important to say that the Tendine device is a device for the multidisciplinary heart team, not only when it comes to decision making, but only also when it comes to implantation, actually. So here we see really surgeons and cardiologists just working side to side. This is uh, amazing, I think. This valve is suitable for both etiologies, as we learned, for primary and secondary MR, and that makes a difference when it comes to other devices. It's also suitable to MEC patients, as we learned. It achieves uh, complete relief of MR, what is a great uh, feature. And it has a very high safety profile. So we haven't seen procedural mortality, stroke, emergency surgery, or ECMO uh, within a large set of patients, but it's really good. And uh, we also learned from Paul that it may have additional beneficial left ventricular remodeling effects and hemodynamic improvement due to the tether. So this is something that is very unique, unique to the tendine valve and may play a big role when it comes to deciding for a therapy in the future. And with this, I'd like to thank you all for attending our symposium and uh, thanks for watching this. Thanks again, of course, both of you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you.